When you're using the Linux operating system, you need some place to store all of this information. So in this presentation, I'm going to take you through the different options you might have for storing information in Linux. We'll also look to see how the Linux operating system references those particular drives and the partitions. One advantage of Linux is that it runs on so many different types of hardware. One of the things you'll run into often are that older computers can still run the Linux operating system pretty easily. So you may run into a type of drive called the PATA drive. This was originally called the AT attachment drive. And then we included the parallel in front of it to differentiate it from the serial AT attachment drives. We'll talk more about those in a moment. This is a drive type that's been around for a very long time, since 1999. So it's very common to find this on very old computers. It was originally called the Integrated Drive Electronics, or IDE. So sometimes you'll hear the old folks like me talk about an IDE drive. We're really talking about these PATA drives. Western Digital started this type of drive. It was called the Western Digital IDE. They even created an enhanced version of it. So you may see referenced in older documentation the EIDE drives. Because there's a newer type of drive called a SATA drive or a serial AT attachment, we've used the term parallel in front of these older ATA drives to designate it as that older parallel type communication or the PATA drive. If you look in one of these older systems with these PATA drives, you'll see that there are these very big ribbon cables that are running from the motherboard or the drive controller all the way to the drive itself. And it's these very big 40 wire or 80 wire types of cables that are very distinctive to this PATA connection. These motherboard connections on this side would then connect to one of these two connectors on the other side. On these older PATA drives that use the 40 wire cables, device 0 is the one that is closest to the motherboard connection. And your device 1 would be farthest away from the motherboard connection. Newer PATA drives can transfer data much faster. And they require an 80 wire cable to be able to do that. This 80 wire cable, notice, has the device 0 at the end of the drive. So it's swapped from the 40 wire configuration. And the device 1 is the one that is closest to the motherboard connection. When you're configuring the drive, you also tell the drive that you would like it to be the master drive, or drive 0, or the slave drive, which is drive 1. Or you might configure the drive to figure it out on its own, depending on where you're plugging it into the cable. You usually see some documentation right on the drive itself. And if you look closely, you can see if you'll set it to the master configuration, the slave configuration. Although a lot of people simply use cable select, and the drive will determine based on where it's plugged in. So if you're trying to plug in a drive and it's not working in your Linux system, make sure that you look at how the drive is configured and where it happens to be plugged in on that PATA cable. The actual connection then is pretty easy. There's probably a PATA connector right on the motherboard. There may be an extra drive controller that's plugged into one of the expansion slots. And your ribbon cable runs all the way from that controller and plugs into the drive on the other side. And obviously, there would be power connected to this drive as well so that you have that single connection. If you need a separate drive on the single controller, you would plug it into that extra connector that's also on that same PATA cable. If you're sitting in front of a computer, it's almost impossible to tell what type of drive might be inside of it. So it might be worthwhile to look at the BIOS itself and see what the BIOS tells you about the drives that are inside of it. If you look in the BIOS, you'll probably see a PATA drive. There might be other types of drive controllers in there. And on those older machines, the PATA may be the default type of drive, which means your Linux bootloader may be on that PATA drive itself. If you go into Linux and look at the naming convention, you might see the drives specified as slash dev slash HDA, slash dev slash HDB, HDC, and so on. That's specifying a PATA type of drive. When you look at the partitions on those drives, for instance, if we had a dev HDA, it may have multiple partitions. And you'll see those specified as dev HDA1 and dev HDA2, et cetera. That's one very easy way to see if this is a PATA drive. But it's not the only way, because some of the newer drivers will use SCSI naming conventions instead of these older PATA naming conventions. We'll talk more about SCSI naming conventions later on in this presentation. 
I mentioned that we added the term parallel in front of the ATA to create that PADA drive name because we invented an upgrade, if you will, to the PADA standard called SATA, or Serial AT Attachment. Again, you can go into the BIOS of your computer. It may be able to give you clues as to the type of drive that is inside of your computer. One nice thing about SATA is it's a much smaller cable because it's a serial connection. But unlike PADA, where I could put two drives on a single cable, it's not the same way with SATA. I can only have one drive on one cable connected to the motherboard, and you'd say one to one. So you, if you wanted eight drives in your computer, you must must have eight interfaces on your motherboard. We wouldn't be using this upgraded drive unless there were some advantages. And one of the biggest advantages of SATA for our users is that it's a much faster interface. In fact, SATA Revision 3.0 can transfer data at 6 gigabits per second. And because a lot of what we're doing today is on these solid state drives, that allows us to get some very, very high throughputs using this SATA standard. This motherboard display gives you a good comparison between the PADA and the SATA interfaces. You'll notice there's an IDE interface at the bottom. That's your parallel ATA, your PADA interface. It's even using that older IDE term. And here are the SATA connectors. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six. And because it's a one-to-one -one ratio, I can now have six SATA connected devices running from this single motherboard. Just based on the motherboard picture that we saw, the SATA connectors are much smaller. And if we put them side by side, here is one single PADA connector, and here is a SATA data connector. You can see there is a big difference. And that's one of the other advantages to SATA is now we can have these much smaller cables inside of our computer system, which allows us to get better airflow and therefore better cooling inside of our computer cases. These smaller SATA cables are also much easier to install. You can see a data cable connection here. This is the SATA power connection that you might use. Notice the power connection is actually a little bit wider than the data connection. If we look at the naming convention inside of Linux, we will also see that SATA drives are also now using that same naming convention as SCSI. All of your newer systems, all of the newer drivers you'll run into for all of these drives will all use that single naming convention convention, which makes it very easy to use. But if you ever run into an older version of Linux, perhaps one that's using older drivers, you may see that older type of IDE naming convention. But for SATA, because it's relatively new, we simply have that same standard as we're going to see when we look at SCSI drives. SCSI stands for Small Computer Systems Interface. And as I mentioned here, it's not really a small standard any longer. We used to have very large mainframe computers with very big drives on it. And these SCSI drives were so small in comparison. SCSI is designed to allow you to connect many different SCSI devices to a single controller. In fact, you can have up to 16 devices in what we call this SCSI chain. If you're looking at documentation, you may see the SCSI format as many different names. It may be called Fast SCSI and Ultra Wide SCSI and Ultra 3 SCSI. The SCSI standard's been around for so long that as we've improved and upgraded, we've added new naming conventions to all of these new versions. Even today, we've got SCSI formats that can even run over the network with the IP protocol called iSCSI. One of the advantages we have with SCSI is we can plug in so many different types of devices to it, not just storage devices, but maybe even printers or scanners or tape drives. Anything that we need to communicate back and forth to our computer, we can plug into one of these SCSI chains. On the older SCSI systems, we could fit eight devices on what we call a narrow bus. The latest SCSI devices will allow us to connect 16 devices. You may also hear that referred to as the wide bus. One of the advantages of SCSI is that it's a very intelligent protocol. We can have so many different types of devices, and yet SCSI is able to automatically configure and manage the data communication back and forth between all of those different devices. And it's been around for so long that it's a very common and comfortable protocol for our different applications to be able to use. And now that we've got a lot of virtualization in our environments, you'll find a lot of the virtual drives that we use use that SCSI protocol because it is so powerful. One of the things that sometimes trips people up is that the SCSI chain has to be terminated, which means you have to put a termination on the end so the data will not bounce around on that SCSI chain. A lot of the newer SCSI drives have automatic termination. So if you're working with 
with physical SCSI drives, you have to make sure that the end of the chain is terminated. In a virtual environment, of course, we don't have that concern. But you still have physical SCSI drives that are out there in those data centers. So you have to make sure they are set up and configured properly from the very beginning. There are a lot of different kinds of SCSI interfaces. This is a SCSI Ultra 3 interface that it's on my motherboard. If I look at it from the front, you'll see that it has all of these pins that are on it. I think that's a 68-pin connector. It's a very different than other connectors that you might see on your computer. And it has a different type of cable that you would use as well. We plug into the motherboard here. And there are different connectors along the length of that cable so that we can plug in all of those different SCSI devices. We look closely. You can see all of the pins in there. This cable is also one of those big ribbon cables. But you can see it's even made so that I can bend it a little easier inside of the case. Here's a good example of what I mean when SCSI has so many different physical interfaces. This is just a few of them. There are so many different SCSI interfaces because we've had so many different formats that have been generated through the years. So if you have a storage device and you're looking at the interface and it looks very similar to one of these that you might find, you found a physical SCSI device. Because we often have that single SCSI controller and we're connecting all of these devices along the length of that single cable, we sometimes will call this daisy chaining. That comes from this term of taking daisies and connecting them all together through the stem of the daisy itself. It's a similar scenario with SCSI. You have a SCSI controller. This connects to a hard drive, which then connects to another device, which then connects to another device and another device. And at the very end is where you would have either the physical terminator or you would tell this final device, please terminate this SCSI connection inside of the device itself. Now that you have all of these devices plugged into a single cable, how do you specify which one is which? It's all on a single cable. So obviously, all of the devices are going to hear everything going across that single cable. Well, you do that with something called a SCSI ID. Every device has its own and unique ID number. For instance, you may have a boot disk with a SCSI ID of 0, a floppy disk with an ID of 2, a CD-ROM with an ID of 3, and et cetera. Within a single device, you can then specify what's called a logical unit. So you might have a big drive array you're plugging into a single SCSI ID, but there are separate drives inside of it that you can then specify with individual logical IDs inside of that single physical device. The important part, of course, is that you have to terminate at the end of the SCSI bus. And as long as you've got your termination in the right place, all of those devices now have separate IDs, and they all should be able to communicate across that single SCSI bus. If you ever run into something called serial attached SCSI, we also refer to this as SAS, those devices don't have any jumpers. They don't have any terminators. They don't have any settings inside of it to configure IDs. These serial attached SCSI devices all work automatically. I mentioned earlier in the presentation that whether you're using PATA drives or SATA drives, they're probably all these days going to be using the SCSI convention to be able to identify those drive names. For instance, if I look at this FDISC-L that I performed, there is a dev SDA1 and a dev SDA2. That's because I have a disk called dev SDA inside of my computer. If there was another physical drive, it would be dev slash SDB. Inside of my computer, I might also have CD-ROM drives. And the standard for this is to identify those as slash dev slash scd0 slash dev slash scd1. So again, we're having CD as part of the name of the drive itself. The lettering or the numbering of these is going to be based on the SCSI ID of the drive. So if you have a SCSI ID of 3, that's going to be my first one because perhaps I don't have drives on 0 or 1 or 2. We'll call that slash dev slash SDA. If there's an ID of 4, that's slash dev slash SDB. If there's an ID of 7, that's our last drive, that's dev SDC. So you can see we're simply adding a letter every time we find a drive along that SCSI chain. Now, if we add a new drive or we change the IDs of the existing drives, these numbers might change. That's very common if you're using drives that you can plug in and disconnect like USB drives. So you'll see that those names might change. Make sure that you reference the right drive whenever you're making any changes to those storage devices.
And if for some reason you're not able to see the drives connected to your SCSI bus, or perhaps there's something odd going on with your new installation, check your termination. Make sure that you are either terminating physically at the end of the chain, not somewhere in the middle, or perhaps look at a built-in terminator that might be in the SCSI device itself so that you're able to see all of the devices that are connected to that SCSI controller.